So, uh, my name is Maurice Pentel. I run a thing called the Customer Experience Foundation. And um, I've got one of the best jobs in the world. I advise really big companies and governments about contact strategy, customer experience, and about technology. And I'm going to take you on a little journey today. I'm going to talk to you about um, a couple of the latest phenomenons that I, I think you're going to have to think about. And um, I'm going to talk about a bit to do with nanotechnology. I'm going to talk about 5G networks. I'm going to talk about some fantastic innovations that, that, that I get to play with and to work with, with people. But I thought what I'd do is I'd start with this, sheep. And this is how we tended to see our customers. Um, we told them where to go, we told them what channels to use, we told them how to operate, and you'll notice they're in a pen, and that's because we want to shear them. And then we want them to go out and graze and come back again. And, um, and that's been our relationship for quite a long time. But actually, I was at a conference recently, and someone said, no, they're not sheep anymore. This is the customer. This is the new world. And the guy who wrote this is a guy called Mike Havard. Uh, if you don't know who Mike Havard is, look him up. He's a tremendously interesting guy. And uh, uh, at the bottom of this slide, he said, regulators are becoming less important. And the thing is that as our customers turn from sheep into wolves, are our strategies actually adapting to the situation? That's what I want to talk about today. Um, I hope you're going to enjoy this. So, one of the things about the changing nature of us as customers is the fact that we are now addicted to our mobile phones. A friend of mine said uh, a while ago, we hold our mobile phones more than we hold our children. And I thought that was really clever, but then I saw this thing, and for those of you who don't know, this is the classic picture of Pavlov's dogs. And the thing is that we're addicted to change. We're addicted to the fact that um, the next text, the next message from the boss, the next salacious bit of gossip from Facebook is going to change our lives. So we're constantly, quickly looking at our phones more and more. And what that does for us as customers is make us significantly less tolerant. And that lack of tolerance is expressed in a whole range of ways I hope I'm going to give you some insight to. Here's the thing. Organization is no longer the apex predator. So what happened was there were people, they came out of the caves, they became families, families became tribes, tribes became nations, there were ideas, ideologies, religions, and ultimately governments and from governments we got to organizations. And for a long time, the organization was the apex predator. In social terms, we ruled the roost. But going back to what Mike Havard had said, I realized that actually we are no longer in charge. So let me introduce you to the first concept, social me. This is the new king. Social me, that's me, that's you, that's you, that's you over there at the back who I can't see through the light quite, and uh, over there in the corner as well. Social me, we now are the apex predator of society. And that's probably a surprise to you because you don't think of yourself as that yet, but hopefully by the end of this I'll have pulled the trick off of making you think we are. Okay, so social me, this is social me. My home, my people, my life, my work, my stuff, and you, ladies and gentlemen, are all in my world and controlled by me on my technology. And one of the most significant things about this change is that our ability to bring stuff together, our ability to control that universe of stuff is getting easier and easier and easier. I no longer need to worry about what platform I'm on. I no longer need to worry about my endpoint device, and I'll talk a little more about that later, because everything is merging together into a single experience, a blended experience, if you will. So we're building a project at the moment. It's called the Future House, and what we're doing is we've taken a standard 1910 end of terrace house. There, there it is with our new plants outside. And we're filling it with technology and we're seeing if we can make life easier. And the reason that we're doing this is because it has an impact on social housing and it has an impact on a lot of things. Um, but let me take you through some of the stuff that we've already managed to do. 
So um, what we're able to do these days is I control the lights, I control the heating, and anyone who wants to see me do this, uh, find me afterwards, and I'll actually, uh, I'll actually give you a quick demonstration, assuming that it works, but I didn't want to do it on stage, just in case it didn't. Not only that, but all of my content from my, uh, my uh, Xbox through to my Sky Remote, through to everything, I can control on my mobile phone. Not only can I control it on my mobile phone, ladies and gentlemen, I can actually watch all my content on my mobile phone, or I can even send it to someone else's device. I could put it on your device, including my iTunes and everything else, and I have control of that. But then, not only that, but I can control all the applications on all of my computers elsewhere. I can control my friend's computer, uh, my colleague's computer, my children's computer. I can manage all of that stuff, and that ridiculous picture of me doing an augmented reality thing, that's what I really look like in the mornings. Um, you know, I can do anything of that, and I can deliver it to any device I want. And here we are, these are pictures of my security in the future house. This is what it looks like, and you'll see at the bottom here, I can even change the colors of the lights. And you can imagine being a boy, I, well, I used to be a boy, uh, I'm probably an old man now, but um, you know, I spend a huge amount of time worrying about the colors of the lights these days. And what that does is it creates a personal data cloud. And the personal cloud of all of that information that I'm talking about is something that is changing my relationship with you, but is also probably going to change the way in which we think of cloud in the future. And again, I'll be talking about that. I know uh, others are going to be talking about it, and you've got some, some cracking sessions later on today in which this stuff's going to be covered. But it's all being driven by this Internet of Things idea is changing the way that things are going on and changing what the opportunities are for change. Because there's all of my stuff, and that particular picture is from some bloke who won some competition to win £30,000 worth of gadgets. Uh, 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 you know, uh, and all of it, all of it has an impact on the Internet of Things. So recently I did some work for a, a big company in the States, and we built, a, we, we built an augmented reality insurance inventory. So I can just scan a device, I can look at the device, and if it breaks or if something goes wrong with it, then they'll replace it because they've got my inventory. And from my point of view, although I can't do the Tom Cruise thing of moving things around yet, uh, we're working on it. But, um, you know, I can still control all of those things. And, of course, I, just when I was talking before about um, uh, uh, any device, uh, I can do everything on that fridge. Yeah. So um, here's an interesting thing. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that most people do more video conferencing outside of work than they do in work? Yeah, the majority of the world do not work for organizations, do not work in companies that use video conferencing. But across the world, millions of people stay in touch, play games, talk to people, socialize via things like Skype, via uh, FaceTime, via all of these platforms, the majority of consumers are using video conferencing today. I have, as a member of social me, an omni-channel, multi-sync, whether it's asynchronous, uh, synchronous, whatever. I have any access to any platform I want, and I can hold a conversation. And I can hold a conversation that starts on Twitter, that ends up in a phone call, that might be a video conference, that might be a shared desktop, or might simply be a simple face-to-face. -face. And the question you've got to ask yourself as organizations is, what do you have? Because actually, it feels to me at the moment like the consumer's probably got a bit more power than you have. We've got a bit more flexibility as people. And it's one of the challenges. And again, if you think about work, you think about your work relationship, well, when you leave work, you've probably got better tools available to you than you have in work. Because when you're out at work, there's social media. I've got all of these things. I've got all of these wonderful tools and toys. Not only have I got those, but I've got you. I've got my work things. I've got everything I need to do with business and a whole range of other features and functionalities that I'm simply able to access without thinking about. These are commonplace to me today. 
And this leads us to the world of customer power. What is customer power, ladies and gentlemen? It's the practical ability of the customer to set your agenda. And if you don't think they are, well, any of you who are in consumer-facing organizations who aren't thinking about Facebook, who aren't doing Twitter support and all of these other things, that was your customer's idea, not yours. Your customers were on these platforms before you arrived. And your CSR policy, whether or not McDonald's buy their food uh, locally in the UK, customers are telling you what to do. And it doesn't matter where you are in the world, this is true. So uh, I spoke in Istanbul uh, earlier this year, I've had a fantastic year of travel, and I tried to pay for some sweets I was buying for, for uh, all the delegates at this conference um, via my credit card, and the guy looked at me uh, as though I was a lunatic wanting to pay by my debit card. And I walked out of the shop and I almost laughed because he was quite rude to me because he wanted to get back to the online game he was playing on his iPad globally with some bloke in Canada and he didn't see the incongruity of the situation. But it doesn't matter if you're there or if you're here. This is a place where the, you get the coolest view in Singapore. You see, you see across the bay to the, the most fantastic thing. It doesn't matter where you are in the world, technology is changing it all. And it's building that single relationship. It is about the single relationship. So when we're talking about the single relationship, what does it matter? What does it mean? I'll tell you why it matters, and I'll tell you what it means. It means change. It means fundamental economic change. Did you know, ladies and gentlemen, that some of the banks have seen a 60% drop in footfall into their branches in the last 18 months. That 60% of the people who went into banks don't go anymore because three years ago people decided to start building mobile banking apps, or, well, slightly longer, but, you know, you get the idea. And it changes the fundamental uh, uh, economics of everything. You, know, you won't be paying for things at a checkout in a few years' time. Yeah, there's a few million jobs. You will not be making appointments via someone on the telephone for most government organizations within two years. There's a few jobs. And of course, you know, what's going to happen to our high streets when all banks leave? There's a little bit of a challenge. So it does have a huge impact. And the reason that this is all coming about is because we no longer control innovation. When I was a young man, we built huge chunks of technology and we told the world how to operate. And working with organizations like Bell Labs and, uh, and some, of the, some of the organizations here, we decided what people did because consumer innovation simply couldn't keep up with us. But now the economy flows in a completely different way. And let me try and explain to you about why this balance of power is so significant. It wasn't the motor car that killed the saddle maker. It was mass production. It was the coalescence of mass production coming along and saying, we can not only build this and this and this and this, but we can build you a car and it's available to everybody. And because it's available to everybody, that's what killed the saddle. You see, we as organizations, and I talked about this just a moment ago, we as organizations, we spend big money on innovation. We create stuff, and, and you know, I, I do some academic work from time to time, and as a joke one day, I put a group of students on to working out how much money was spent by, again, some of the organizations who are represented here today, but the world's biggest organizations on innovation, and it's in billions. And that made me feel good, because I, I like to go to a board meeting and talk big numbers. But um, in the real world, the consumers are spending in trillions. We're in billions, they're in trillions. So how can I express that in a really simple way that you can understand? Let me have a go. We are Usain Bolt. Yeah, under 10 seconds, this guy can do 100 meters. He's a remarkable specimen. And if you're in an organization, then you're probably a black belt in Six Sigma. We think we're lean, we're mean, we're running machines, and we're really bloody cool. But 
the consumer's driving a Ferrari. And in that 10 seconds, ladies and gentlemen, they've gone to naught to 120 miles an hour. It's the difference in terms of where we are, where they are, and where things are going. We are already behind the consumer, and the gap is getting larger. Consumers now have better endpoint devices. I, I talked before about you know, the fact that I can take all of this content anywhere on any device. Yeah, but it's phones, it's tablets, it's, you know, I don't have one of the watches yet, but you know, when they come out, of, I'm gonna be the first, I won't be the first in the queue, I'll send someone. But you know, I'm gonna have, a, I'm gonna have that, uh, we're doing an exhibition next year, and I, you know, I'm gonna play with one of these fridges, I'm gonna see if I can make it talk to me, because um, I do have such a fun job. You know, the devices are changing and, and the functionality is being delivered to anywhere. And that leads us to the world of the contact center. That leads us to the way that the contact center is going to work in the future. Because if you imagine all of that functionality coming together, then why wouldn't you want to deliver this to your customers or indeed deliver your customer to your expert beyond the call center wall why wouldn't you want to create an environment in which you can deliver functionality everywhere? And that's one of the challenges. So I want to talk very briefly. I'm going to give you a, a quick case study. Uh, here is one of my pet hates. So you're on a website. It doesn't quite work. And what you're trying to do is, uh, is talk to someone to help you through the problem. You're 10 minutes into this thing. So the last thing you want to do is go away. But actually, what you've got to do is you've got to end the session You've got to find the phone number that they hid somewhere on the website because they really don't want you to phone. I can see you smiling, sir. I guess you've had this experience. I'm not the only one. Yeah, and, uh, and then you dial and then you hold on for three and a half minutes if you're from my mobile phone provider. Well, they tell you I can find the answers on the website and my call is important. No, it isn't, or you'd answer it. If I was important to you, you'd answer the phone. Yeah, so, you know, and then I'm going to have a conversation with your agent. I'm going to be slightly disgruntled, slightly unhappy. And uh, as a result of that, probably, you know, that agent who's had 30 of these phone calls today is busy looking in the papers or, more to the point, looking online for his next job. Yeah, somewhere easier. So uh, that's what happens in the beginning of the process. Yeah, steps one, two, three, four. Okay, you go through the IVR and then you start the conversation again. Well, three and four are what's killing it. If something goes wrong on the website, what do I really, really want to do? What I really want to do is I want someone to come into the website, see what I'm seeing, and to actually help me with what I'm doing now. I don't want to go, hello, yeah, I'll do my security stuff, and because of the time, I'm not gonna uh, take you through the whole thing, but. You know, and I was on the website, and blah, 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 and about four minutes after that, we're actually getting to the point where the person says to me, would you like to switch the router on and off again? And I'm slamming the phone down, because actually I've done that five times, because I'm a techie. Imagine if there was a button in an app on a website. Imagine if that button scraped all of the information there was, or delivered you with your security token to an agent. I don't have to start again. The person doesn't need to take me through security a second or third time. It may be that if it's a serious thing that there's a, a, a next level of security. But also the other thing is I'm not sitting on a ton of empty IVR ports because those cost money. Yeah. I'm queuing virtually. And I built this as an idea for a big bank um, seven, eight years ago. They were that their initial estimate of the amount of money they were saving on IVR ports, and they're a huge user of telephone, was um, with lines and ports was about three million pounds a year they saved. Building the button into the application cost them a couple of hundred thousand pounds. I don't know, that's a pretty good return on investment. And it's this ability to blend channels together that provides the ability to save money and to improve customer experience. Put your hands up if you want to be in a queue. Look around. Who does? Yeah. If you like the music on hold, raise your hands. No. You know, I'm going to give this up before I lose. Now, here is what we designed for these people. Excuse the design, but I did it. And obviously, now it looks much funkier and 
some people, some impossibly slim, slim young people with product in their hair actually took it and turned it into something really beautiful. But this 17 bits leads you to hundreds and hundreds of customer journeys. And in the time it takes you to say, welcome to, I've already pressed three of those, your call is important, and I'm already at the point where I've put my information in and we're there. And now all I've got to do is I put my phone down and you come back to me when you're ready and you've told me when you're ready. Isn't that a better experience? Not only does it mean that I'm a happier customer, but it's also saving you agent time and a whole range of other things. Improved customer experience. And I speak now officially as the chairman of the Customer Experience Foundation and its founder. If it doesn't pr produce a customer experience improvement and save you money, it's probably not a real customer experience improvement. I've never worked on a major customer experience program that didn't do both. It's a really good indicator. Save your money and improve the customer experience. The first mobile banking apps were done because people wanted to see if they could do them. And I was talking to a, a large bank who were an innovator in this field, and the guy in charge of the program said, you know, we never thought we'd save money. We just wanted to see how it was going to work. And I really wanted to shake him and say, well, what do you think good customer experience is, except for saving money and effort? More functionality coming together. Now, you know, it used to be back in the day that what we did as organizations was we invented proprietary in order to lock everybody into our world. But that no longer works for us. What we need to do today is we need to be part of the crowd because we are absolutely in the world of collaboration, federation, and consumer power or customer power as we like to think about it. Because every new piece of functionality is not an experience in itself in the, in the capital sense. It's part of our single digital experience. It's part of our life as social me. And that's hugely important. All of this stuff, all of these tools. So the one on the right is something I built for a, a retailer who don't like to be undersold. Um, as a model, and what I did was I, 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 I did this thing, and you can point at an iPad or a, a phone at a, at a doorway, you can point at a sofa, and as long as it can pick up a product code, it will tell you if you can get through the door. Then I sent it to some guy in the States who said, yeah, I know, but actually we've got a thing we've added to, and it will tell you if you can um, take it up the stairs. And uh, my apologies, but then someone else said, Actually, we've cracked the, um, the Nike wristband, and we can tell you if the person lifting up the stairs is going to have a heart attack. <laughs> and I thought, you know, game, set, and match. I give up. Yeah? All of these tools are available to me everywhere I am. And as a consumer, I've got access to the internet. What have your staff got? Most customer-facing staff do not have access to the same tools. Yeah? They don't have access to it. Not a very good strategy. If it's better, use it. Consumer platforms are becoming the strategy. And it's a serious issue, this strategy issue. Most organizations simply are not managing innovation. One of the reasons why I come to these events, I mean, obviously, you know, Jonathan's a very charming guy, and I like the food and everything else. But the reality is that you need relationships with organizations like Britannic in order to work out what the next channel is and in order to have a core infrastructure that will support it. Because I don't know what the next channel is, and I get paid to look at the future. Somewhere in a garage somewhere, someone's going to build something that we've never thought of, never heard of, and it's going to be uh, different. In case you think I'm wrong, think of the iPads you've all got and the tablets. That wasn't on anyone's radar. You know, this world that we've got, it's every device, it's everything. Because wherever I am in the world, I really want access to everything. Five G networks are coming. I'm off to Seoul early next year. I'm going to see the, the implementation 
uh, of the 5G network thing that they're doing and some of the other stuff that they're doing. There's some bloke who's working on nanobots that you can, uh, you, you can inject into someone's arm, uh, which scares the hell out of me. I saw you pull a face over there. Me too, scares the hell out of me, but they've invited me. I'm going to go and have a look at it and you know, uh, see how good I do with Korean food. And um, here is a real example of how quickly things are changing. These really cool young people are the people from Top Man. They're your personal shoppers from Top Man. And you know what platform they're on? Google Hangouts. One of the UK's most influential retailers has just gone Google Hangouts. Where are you with this kind of technology today? What is your position on all of this stuff? And that really is the important question. So let's talk about you for a second. I'm bored of talking about me and my world. This is the stuff that you're going to have to learn to adapt to. Because every day there's some new innovation. Now, for those of you who don't recognize some of these, let me take you through them. OK, Ray-Ban, I, no I don't need to take glasses off and put them on. I can have fake glasses, as you saw in my first picture of me. I can, I can test all the different styles. And what that means for Ray-Ban is in every location that I am, their entire stock is available to me in order for me to get an idea. Yeah. Over here, that is genuinely Virgin Atlantic's use of Google's glasses. They're already using it. It was announced last, uh, it was announced last year. It went live the beginning of this year. They're using it. For those who don't know it, that's Halo, and there are a whole host of applications like it. Press a button, it'll find a cab close to you. And the important thing, and the reason I put it up there, is because all they're using is a standard API into Google's Maps. And it gives a huge amount of information, including the, the, the speed of traffic. And I love this one. I travel so much, I always end up in a car not knowing how the buttons work. This is Audi's augmented reality experience in which it shows me what the buttons do. Because when you go to an airport, if you see a car going with all the lights flashing and the windscreen wipers on and some ludicrous radio station, that's me, I've lost control again. And if you think change isn't real, ladies and gentlemen, here is one of the oldest franchises there is in this country. And the interesting thing is, I think it, I, I think it says, she was trolled in about five minutes. Yeah? Not only is the queen now engaged in the digital space, but she's also experiencing the wonder and marvel of tweeting. And that's the queen. Because this is our world. We're experimenting at the moment with some robots, and I, I was going to bring some robots along today, but they really are quite dangerous. They're not working properly. Um, but, you know, there is, up there at the top on the left-hand side, this is um, our, our good friends at Amazon's exper uh, experiments with delivering packages. It's an interesting thing. It's not the way it's probably going to work. The thing that we're doing in the future house is you will be able to deliver a package to my house when I'm not there, and I'll be able to let you in, and I'll be able to do that in a secure fashion within about a year, uh, within about a year from now. Um, but, you know, the augmented reality catalog, IKEA have an augmented reality catalog. They've had it for three or four years. I was in China. This guy said to me from IKEA in China, he said, look at this, this is what we do. And I didn't have the heart to tell him that, in fact, I'd seen it in, um, in the UK two years earlier. Yeah, the pace of change is unbelievable. And because the pace of change is unbelievable, we don't believe it. But mathematically speaking, scientifically speaking, because everything is coming to a set of endpoints, the pace of change is literally faster than in history. And that's vital. Because... Put your hands up if you've got an innovation strategy in your organization today. One, two, a few. All right, put your hands up if as consumers you're aware that new stuff is coming along and every time you turn around there's some new thing someone's showing you. Put your hands up if you've experienced that. And that's kind of important. 
Yeah, because this is where we are. You've got to think like a customer. It's got to be access anywhere. So I want to make you all into customer experience and, uh, and innovation experts. Here's something that's coming along. All right, Starwood, one of the world's largest hotel chains, have announced this week that keys on mobile phones are going to be run out of their, uh, sorry, uh, are going to be deployed within their organizations. Count from today to the first time you experience and you will see the pace of take up. My bet is that most of you in this room will have done that experience within two to three years. Hilton are trying it, a whole range of organizations are trying it. We're thinking about it in the future house. That one innovation will give you a indicator of the pace of change. And the cloud. You know, when I first started talking about the cloud, I was doing some work for a, a, a major outfit. When I started talking about the cloud, it meant something completely different. It's like the Internet of Things. The Internet doesn't mean what it meant, and things don't mean what they meant, but we're adapting as we go. The consumer cloud is going to be a very different thing in the future. And no, I don't know what it is. I just know that it's not where it was six months ago, and most of us are thinking a year before that, because that's how long it takes us to innovate. You've got to think about the role of your channels and you've got to think about the cost of those channels, because most of you are transactionally focused, individual channel, individual transaction, cost is this. But actually, what happens if I walk into a store, or I Twitter, I tweet, I do a whole range of different things, all at the same time, where do you attribute the cost? Yeah, are you really attributing cost to something that's real, or are you just attributing cost to what you're used to? You're going to need to measure new things, ladies and gentlemen. There's no doubt about it. You're going to need to be thinking about, I, I know Mark's going to be talking about this, you're going to need to be talking about effort and ease and how difficult it is to do business with you. Yeah, You're going to be measuring different things in the future. Because, ladies and gentlemen, for social me, for me, this is what this place looks like today. And I'll just take you through this very quickly. I can see my emails, I can see my phone, I can see my LinkedIn stuff. I tweeted this morning, God knows why. Uh, I can see where a Big Mac is, a Starbucks. I can see what's going on in the future house. And um, this is the world for me as a consumer. Not even as the, you know, in, in my job. This is my world as a consumer. But for most organizations that I talk to around the world, this is what the world looks like. And it's just whether or not you're there or you're there. I know what I've said is not easy, ladies and gentlemen. But simply because it's not easy doesn't mean that it's not real. Innovation and the management of innovation will be a keystone skill over the next three or four years. So I'd like to thank you very much for your time. I hope you found this interesting. I hope you found it useful. And of course, I'd like to thank my hosts. And I hope you have a great day. Thank you for your time. <laughs>